So my name is Erstein Kolsrud. I'm a software engineer at Click in Lund. Uh, and at Click we use a number of different programming languages, but the one that I'm mostly involved in in my day-to-day -day work is C Sharp. But I also have a background from using Haskell as a functional language. Um, and when I joined the Click about six years ago now, uh, I was totally new to C Sharp. I'd never written a line of code in that language before. But I was very happy to see that a lot of the things that I've learned and used in Haskell could also be used in C Sharp. Uh, mainly um, the Lambda expressions and the link library that I'm sure many of you are aware of and I've been using a lot, a lot of times. So that's sort of a native thing that's been in Haskell for uh, since the beginning of that language. So I was very happy to see I could be able to do data processing in that way in C Sharp as well. Uh, since then, more things have happened in C Sharp and with C Sharp 7 that was released about two years ago now, they introduced two uh, other features, namely tuples and pattern matching. There are also features that have been in Haskell since the early 90s. And that's sort of a natural part of the tools that you'll be using if you do development in that language. So the goal with this presentation is to basically talk a little about what those features are used for in Haskell and how the everyday life in the world of a Haskell developer would be in terms of leveraging those features. So I'll just give a small repetition of what these features are. If I can get this to work, let's see. There we go. So tuples. Tuples is basically um, an anonymous data structure, just like lambda expressions is an anonymous uh, function. Uh, tuples are used to anonymously group data into one single entity. Uh, and a simple example of how to use it could be something like this. So this is a very basic wrapper functions for one of the functions you will find in the maths library. Uh, this math divrem here has been in the library since the beginning of C sharp, probably since 1.0, I think. Uh, and in those days, we did not have tuples. So when you want to write a function that was supposed to return two values, like this one, it's supposed to return the integer division and the reminder after that. Um, then you had two choices. You could either use an output parameters, like they did here. So they have an output parameter with a reminder. Or they could basically uh, implement a structure that would encapsulate these two values and return them as one single entity. Now with C Sharp 7, tuples are native to the language. So now with the language, instead of uh, using a structure or the tuple class that's been around for a while as well, you can just simply write the type structure like this. So it returns a pair of integers, just wrap them in parentheses, and when you want to construct a value of that, you will just wrap those two values in pairs, and you will have this anonymous data type as a tuple. Now the interesting thing comes when you want to use these values, because let's say we want to write a function like this, so print division will call this function and print the results in a nice form. So 13 divrem 5 would be 2 and 3 fifths. Then we can immediately deconstruct that tuple as we call the uh, function. So instead of assigning this to a value or a variable that will then uh, access the in individual components of, we can just assign this directly to a tuple. And here we will immediately get handles to these, uh, these members of the tuple. So that when I want to print my string, I can just use those values uh, immediately. So it's really nice syntactic sugar, and I'll show you some examples of how this is used uh, in, in Haskell later on. The other feature is uh, pattern matching. And pattern matching is a little hard to explain where it is, so I'll just give an example for it. So this is an example taken from uh, one of Microsoft's uh, pages describing this feature. Uh, and it illustrates a function they call uh, compute area, which takes an object representing some form of shape uh, and we want to write this function that takes this shape, and depending on what shape it is, we wanted to compute the area of that function, or that shape. So we check if it's a square. If it is, then we can typecast it to a square, and we get the handle s, which is now a square, and we can access the, pr the uh, properties of that square now. The side is a property of a square, not an object. But if it's a circle, well, we check if it's that type, then we can typecast it to a circle, and now we can access the radius, and so on. So this is a pattern that with C-sharp you can write in a more consistent way. So you can write like this now with C-sharp 7. So we can do a switch statement directly on that object. And then depending on what flavor this object we have, which type it has, we can immediately get a handle to that and then access the inner properties uh, as it was of that type. It's a very convenient thing. But again, this has been in, in Haskell for a long time. So me coming into this, it's not just about syntactic sugar, but it actually will enable some uh, nice pro programming uh, techniques that I will show you. And the uh, main topic that we'll be talking about, or the main problem domain, is uh, code generation. Code generation and API testing. Has anyone here done any code generation in time? A couple of you. Yeah, a number of you. 
So for one reason or another, I've been involved in a number of projects that have been doing code generation, both at uh, Click using C Sharp, but also in uh, using Haskell in other companies. And it's been really interesting to sort of um, um, compare those two methodologies to, and see how, what the effects of the difference are. So uh, what I've been using it for at uh, Click is to generate uh, .NET SDK. So we have this API that is used to communicate with our, um, uh, with our tool. Uh, and uh, you can send it, it's based on JSON RPC over WebSockets. So you will hook up on a WebSocket and then you can send these small commands to the, to the machine and it will uh, then return result based on that, uh, the request you're sending. And um, part of the definition of the API looks like this. So this is one of the basic methods that you can access within our system. So this is a create object method. It has a return type, it returns a generic object, and these are all constructs used in our tools widely. And it has a set of parameters, so it has an input uh, property set for this object. Generic object properties is typed there. And what we would do in this code generation uh, project would be to take this specification and produce C sharp code from it. So this is one example of a method we will generate for this specific, uh, this specific method. So we'll take the different components for the from the uh, specification. For instance, the name of this object function is now create object, coming from that uh, method definition, of course. The parameters will also be based on the parameters of the uh, specification. So we have a generic objects properties input parameter here. This again is a structure defined in the, uh, the uh, specification of our API. So this is also a generated type. And we have all these different layers of generated um, uh, entities until we get down to this send a sync message operation here, which is accessing the lower level non-generated code. And the responsibility of this operation is to take that request, um, package it as a request object, and then this send a sync will turn that into a JSON string and send it over the WebSocket and wait for a reply, basically. Now, when you're doing code generations, the uh, sort of basic naive approach is to start just concatenating strings. So if I want to emit this function here, I will have a string that is return, send a sync, parentheses, and so on. But that doesn't really scale when you're doing larger scale uh, code generation, because you will find quite quickly that you run into all these problems with like mismatching parentheses or spelling mistake in some function name, and it's really tedious to debug that. So instead of doing that, we went with a library provided by Microsoft called Codom. And Codom is used, has anyone here used that, by the way? Yeah, there's one at the back there. Good, two. So Codom is a library used for basically building the structure of a program. And if we want to build an expression like x plus one minus one like this, then we have, uh, we could do something like this. So Codom provides classes that, um, uh, that constitutes or represents expression. And uh, this, then uh, we have multiple extensions to this class, uh, like a binary operator expression, like we see here. We also have variables and so on. So to create this expression, we will have a binary operator expression that takes two argu three arguments. Two of them are the sort of left and right parts of the operator, and the third one is the, the operator itself. And as you can see, it's nested like this, so that we can have a binary operator expression as the uh, right expression as well. So what's the point of this then? Well, the result of doing this in Codom is that you end up with basically a graph. You have a graph or a tree that represents the structure of the program that you want to generate code for. And the advantage of this is that you're separating sort of the structure of, of, your, of your, um, your programs from what you want to do with it. But of course, we don't want to have just this graph. We want to actually turn it into a string. And at this point, we have two choices. We can have an object-oriented approach and the object-oriented approach, I would say, would be to give the responsibility for doing this code generation to the individual nodes. So that in this case, if you want to do this object-oriented, you would have this binary operator knowing that I know how to print myself as C sharp. I will have to print the left expression, I have to print the right expression, and then I have to combine the results, right? There are quite a few problems with that, uh, especially in terms of uh, extensibility. So what Codom did was not to go that way. Instead, they went with a functional way. Now, Codom is not really a functional language per se, but this approach is actually functional, I would say. And the functional approach is not to give this responsibility to nodes, but instead allow the user to write functions that traverses this tree structure and performs the operation that the user wants to do. 
So they separate the functionality from the structure of the, of the code. And a big reason for why Codon went with this, I believe, is that they didn't know really what language we wanted to print it to. The purpose of the, of the toolkit is to be, provide a, a way to do code generation, and they provide predefined uh, functions for generating C Sharp and, uh, uh, and a couple of other languages, or Visual Basic, I think. But if I want to generate Java from this, because this structure here has nothing to do with C Sharp, it's actually called an abstract syntax tree. It just represents the structure of the language, nothing more than that. So I could easily write a function that takes this and prints Java or Go or whatever, Haskell even. So, I'll now switch over to Haskell and show you how this is done there. Uh, and we'll start by a little basics on how you declare types in Haskell. So this is a very small version of um, um, data structure representing expressions that you can write in Haskell. So I've defined a, a data type expression which has, comes in three different flavors. This is also a little uh, different from what you would typically do in, in C Sharp because you don't have this type of constructs here. Um, the data type here is actually, uh, has a fancy name, it's called algebraic data type. And it's a data type that can come in multiple flavors like this. Closest thing you would do in C Sharp would be to have like classes extending each other or interfaces and such. But this is how you do it in Haskell. So we have three different flavors. We have a number that takes an integer as an argument. We have a variable that takes the name of that variable as an argument. And we have a binary operator, which just like in the codom, it takes uh, an operator and the left and the right expression for that binary operator. Now that we have defined this data type, and then we have the operator itself, which is just an enumeration type here. So I'm just taking these four as example here. Add sub -modive. So if we want to create an instance of this, we can do like this. So if I want to create this x plus one minus one expression, then I can just use these names from the data type directly, because these are now constructor functions as well that creates this instance of this type. So I can have a binary operator add, whose left expression is the variable x, and whose right expression is another binary operator, like this. All right. So now we have been able to create this graph, like we did in, in Codom earlier. Now I want to actually do something with this. So I want to write a function called print expert, whose goal it is to print the expression. Surprise. And it will take an expression as an argument and return a string. And this is how we will do a type declaration in Haskell. So you have this colon, colon, and the uh, list of the parameters. And how do we do that then? Well, in Haskell, there's really only one way to do that, and that is through pattern matching. Because this data type comes in three different flavors. And what we want to do for printing this depends, ver depends on which, type of which flavor it is. So I'll do a switch statement on the expression, case E of, and then I have to implement the printing for each of these three different flavors. So if it's a number, then I write like this. If it's a number, I pattern match on a number, then I have an access to the, that integer, which is the argument to the number, and then I can just turn that number into a string. Show is a Haskell function for turning a, a value into a string. If it's a variable, well, then I have the identifier, I have the string already, so I can just return the, uh, the identifier. And if it's a binary operator, then it's a little more interesting case, because then I have to do, do this process of printing the individual subtrees and then concatenating it all. So I will print the left expression, I'll print the operator, print the right expression, I'll wrap it in parentheses, and I'll just concatenate all those strings. So concat is a function in Haskell that takes a list of values and concatenates them into one. All right, any questions on that? No? So, that's the first function for uh, showing you pattern matching in Haskell. Let's do something a little more interesting. So if you have a look at this uh, tree up here, we can see that we could easily simplify this tree. We have this one minus one part here that could easily be simplified into zero. So let's write a little uh, function that takes one of these trees, one expression, and tries to simplify that expression. All right, sort of a partial evalu evaluation thing. Again, pattern matching is what we do because the type of simplification will depend on which flavor it is. And if it's a number or a variable, the underscore here is a don't care. We don't care about what the internals are. If it's a number or a variable, well, then we just return the expression as it was. We don't do anything there. But if it's a binary operator, that's when we need to do something, some interesting stuff. So how would we do that? Any suggestions? 
Anyone? Well, the goal is to reach these numbers, right? So you want to see if, if both of these expressions are numbers, then we can basically simplify it. But before, before we pattern match directly, we also want to simplify the subtrees, because they, in turn, can be big subtrees of numbers as well, with our binary operators. So we start by simplifying the subtrees, and after doing that, we want to pattern match on the results of those simplifications. And in Haskell, we can do like this. So I can write a case statement that switches on a tuple. And the contents of that tuple is the simplified subtrees. Because now I can immediately just look at the internals of that tuple and deconstruct it like this. So here I have both deconstructed the tuple and I'm pattern matching only in the values. And if both of them are numbers, well, then I create a new number and I need to write some evaluation function that takes those numbers and the operator and performs the correct operation. So if it's an add, it does plus and so on. And if they're not numbers, well, there are more simplifications we could do to this tree, but I'll just leave it at that. If they're not numbers, then we have two new possibly simplified trees, and we'll just create a new binary operator that encapsulates those two uh, simplified trees. All right. Any questions? No? So now I'm going to switch gears a little, and I'm going to talk about a library in Haskell that I think is really interesting called uh, QuickCheck. Um, and if there's anything that I want you to take with you from this, calls, uh, this, um, this talk, it is uh, to have a look at this quick check. Because I've, I think the techniques used here are really interesting. I think we could benefit a lot from it in our community as well, in the object-oriented language. So quick check is a library used for generating and testing random test cases. So the goal is to produce a random test case and uh, try to find uh, failures in your code based on those random test cases. So how does this work? Um, quick check introduces what is called a type class called arbitrary. So a type class in Haskell is, uh, we don't really have anything like that in C Sharp, but the closest thing is uh, an interface. So a type class defines a set of uh, functions, and any type that wants to be a member of this class needs to implement those functions. So in that aspect, it's very similar to interfaces, actually. And the arbitrary class, <coughs> excuse me, um, this contains one function called arbitrary, which is a function that, uh, whose role it is to generate a random instance of a certain type. So we now want to make our expression type an instance of this arbitrary type, arbitrary class. And the way we do that is we need to just define it like this, instance arbitrary expression where, and now we have to implement the functions defined by the arbitrary class. So we'll implement the arbitrary uh, function for this. And since uh, our expression comes in three different flavors, we'll have to write one generator for each of those flavors. And QuickCheck has a built-in function called one-off. One-off takes a list of generators and randomly just generates one of them. Each of these will generate an expression now, but with different flavors. So for generating the number flavor, we could write like this. So we generate an arbitrary integer, and then we just return that, that integer wrapped in the num construct. And that, that way we get an expression. Now there's a couple of interesting things about this definition here. And the first one is that we never actually explicitly say that we want to generate an integer. And this arbitrary function here, it doesn't take any arguments. We don't say anything about what that function actually is. But still, Haskell is able to know that we want to generate an int here. Syntactically, there's no difference between that one and the function we are already defining here. But see, Haskell has this really nice type inference mechanism in it. Just like we in C Sharp, we can write var x and then assign it a value. We don't have to explicitly say what x is. Haskell takes this much further and tries to figure out if there's only one possible type that this call can have, then it will use that, and it's done. And in this case, the number construct, that one takes an integer. That means that n has to be an int. And since n has to be an int, then this arbitrary call here must be the arbitrary function that generates an int. And that function is predefined in the quick check library. So I don't have to implement that. Now for the variable, I'll just do something simple here. In the real world environment, this will probably be more complex. But I will just say that I'll pick one or three, um, uh, three different variable names. 
So I'll just allow elements again as a quick check function. So I'll just say x, y, or z, pick any one random of those and wrap them in the var construct. And then for the binary operator, what do we do here? What do we want to generate for the binary operator? Anyone? Well, we want to have random sub-expressions, and we want to have a random operator. So we start by generating a random operator. Then we generate a random left expression. Then we generate a random right expression. And then we just return the binary operator with these three. And again, we don't have to explicitly say which type these arbitrary calls here have, because that's defined by these. And another interesting thing here is that we don't really have to write these arbitrary three times. Because since tuples is a native part of Haskell, libraries like QuickCheck will implement functions for tuples as well. So there is a function in, Haskell, in, in QuickCheck for generating a tuple like tuple. So instead of writing like this, I can just write like this. So this arbitrary function now, I'm doing a deconstruction of the output of that for three values, which means that this has to be the arbitrary function that generates a three tuple, a tuple containing three values, and the individual values in those has to have types coming from these. So, and I feel this is an artifact of having uh, these type of features coming into the language natively. You will have libraries doing stuff with this that just makes your life easier. And then we have to implement the arbitrary operator, and I'll just say pick one random of these four. All right. So that's the full definition required to generate a random expression. Now we want to actually use this for testing. And that's one of the problems with random test cases, that it's really hard to know what they're trying to test. Typically, when you're writing test cases, you will have some idea of what the result of that test should be, so you can compare the expected result with the actual. But that doesn't work for random test cases, because they're just random. So we have to go with property-based testing. And in property-based testing, the goal is not to define what your expected outcome of test is, but instead to express behavior so the system you know should always be true. So let's try to write one of those properties for our expression class, or our expression type. Well, we wrote this function for doing simplifications of a tree. So a very simple property would be a property that checks that if I simplify the tree, then that tree always becomes smaller, or equal. It doesn't grow, at least. So let's write one property like that. And in order to do that, we need to define a function for computing the size of a tree. So we'll write this small function. Size takes an expression and returns the number of nodes in the tree. So for this case, it would return five. And again, we do pattern matching for the different flavors. And if it's a number or a variable, then we're in the leaf. So that's just one. And if it's a binary operator, we should return what? No one dares to ask. Should be able to do this. Yes, left press right press one, exactly. One plus the size of the subtree. Now that we have this function, we can write our property. And the property for quick check is just a, a predicate or a function that takes a value and returns a boolean. So we want to write the function. I will call it prop simplification reduces size. It takes an expression and returns a boolean. And the definition of this property would look something like this. So size e, size of expression, is greater than or equal to the size of the simplified version of that expression. Right? So what's the goal of this now? Now we have this property, and you have a way to generate random instances of our type. So now all we have to do is to start generating them, apply this function. Because if you generate a random expression, and then apply this function and get a true, then we know that, hey, that function holds, or that property holds. But if it returns false, then we know we, hit, we have hit the bug. All right? Ready for demo? This is always a little scary, because this will actually do randomization under the hood. So I hope I get the results I usually get. OK, here we go. Boom. We found a failure. You can all see what the problem is, right? <laughs> That's the other difficult thing with random generated test cases, that they are completely uncomprehensible. 
if we want to start debugging this case, and this is a real bug in the, in the function we just wrote, then we will have a really hard time figuring out what that is. But this, I think, is where QuickCheck really, really shines. Because QuickCheck not only provides a function for um, uh, generating arbitrary test cases, it also provides a function for shrinking them. So this arbitrary clause contains uh, um, a, a function called shrink that takes an instance of a, of a, of a, um, of a type and is supposed to return a list of smaller versions of that same value. And the goal here now is that once we have found one of these cases, a failing case, we can see, okay, what are our potential smaller cases, and we get a long list for that, and then we can start applying the property to the smaller versions and see if we find a failure there. Because then we suddenly have reduced the problem, and then we can just iterate over and over again until we reach a point where we can't reduce it anymore. So let's write this shrink for function for um, our expression type. It will look something like this. Again, we pattern match on the expression. There are three different versions of it. And if it's a number, well, what we do then is that we shrink the int. And that shrink function is now coming from the QuickCheck library, because this is a predefined uh, instance of the arbitrary class. And once we are, so this will turn a long list of integers from that, and we'll just apply the number construct to all those elements. Map takes a list and applies the functions to all the elements of the list. So this will give us a list of smaller numbers. If it's a variable, well, we could discuss if we want to shrink that as well, but I will just go with not shrinking those, so that will be sort of endpoints. Uh, so I'll just return the empty list. There is no way to shrink uh, a variable. And if it's a binary operator, again, this is the really interesting case, because what do we want to do here? How can we shrink a binary operator? Well, the easiest thing is just to drop it. So you have a binary operator, but it's not necessarily needed. So we can just take one of the subtrees. So two possible ways to shrink this tree is to take just the left expression or just the right expression. Plus plus is used to concatenate list, so we can shrink this more. If you can't just cut away the binary operator, then we want to try to shrink the inner components of the binary operator. So we will produce a list of the binary operator where we shrink the operator. So we shrink the operator, and then we construct this as a lambda expression in Haskell. Construct operates based on that. Or we can shrink the left expression, or we can shrink the right expression. This will give us a long list of potential candidates that we can now run the test on again. But again, here we can use tuple as well, because we can shrink a three tuple. So I can write like this instead. I can just shrink this tuple here that I just package up on the fly, basically, and give me all these three values that I can just uh, build on. All right, so let's continue doing that. So here we have the original test case. There I found a smaller case. First shrink step succeeded. And what did it do? I think it, it, dropped, it dropped the minus y at the end. And I can continue like this. Now we dropped the times 23 at the beginning, I think. And you can just continue shrinking until you reach a minimum. Now it's pretty much clear what actually went wrong here. So what do you think went wrong? Divide by zero, exactly. When we wrote the simplification function, we did not take care of the case where we, we reached a divide by zero. So this is actually an exception being generated. And needless to say, it's so much more easy to debug these type of cases that are such minimum cases, because all the information in those cases will be relevant. And I'm going to talk about um, a real-world case where I used this. Unfortunately, not a click, but another company I used to work, uh, where we had this tool that had a scripting interface. So you could write a script for controlling your tool. You would create tasks and uh, do a lot of different manipulations. What I did was that I created an abstract syntax, more or less like what you see here, but a little more complex, of course, that would represent uh, such a script. And then I were randomly generated scripts and execute them in the tool. And what kind of properties would I use here, then? Any suggestions? Anyone? Well, you could do this in all kinds of complicated ways, I guess. But I'm a programmer, so I'm naturally lazy. 
And so I would just look for crashes and null pointer exceptions. We generate scripts, run them in a the tool, and boom, sometimes the tool will crash. And then I say, hey, I have a test case here, and I can start shrinking. And it was really, really fascinating to see that shrink operation occur. Because I would start up, I think I started generating uh, scripts that were 500 lines of code long. And it would start shrinking and doing sort of binary search through the script to see if it could find something smaller. And I almost always ended up with cases that were like two, three, sometimes four lines of code long. And those commands in themselves had been shrunk to the minimum versions. So there was exactly the set of steps required to get to the state where the tool crashed. And that was really amazingly powerful. We found hundreds and hundreds of bugs in the tool using this technique. And the debugging free, the way of uh, fixing those bugs was pretty quick as well, because I could send those minute test cases to R&D, and they would say, OK, I can see that, and I can fix that. And the turnaround time would be really fast. And the quality rose dramatically in the tool after getting this in place. In fact, it was integrated in the way that when R&D would um, introduce a new feature in, their, uh, uh, in, in the scripts, a new feature that you can control through the script, they would, uh, they would immediately make sure that a function for gen or a way for generating those random instances would be available as well, so they could test it as they were developing it. It was really nice to see. I think this is a very, very powerful technique, and I think there are many ways that, we, that this could be leveraged, but I very rarely see that, in a, at least in the object-oriented community, which I think is a little sad. I think we're missing out on something here. Uh, but there are other parts of the industry where this is used a lot, and in particular in the functional domain, uh, this is sort of, if you go to a Haskell forum, for instance, and, and talk about testing, quick check will appear immediately as a way to do that. And there are companies that are ex uh, explicitly working with this type of testing. There's, for instance, one company called, I think it's QWIC, uh, which has a solution for Erlang, and this is being used, by, among other things, about, for, by uh, Ericsson and Klarna and some of those other companies that use Erlang in the industry. Uh, and if you're interested to hear more about that, there's a really good talk about uh, John Hughes, uh, from John Hughes, about him um, uh, using this for de debugging a database um, at, um, for Klarna, which is really good. It has some really uh, interesting test cases there. So if you want to look more about how this is actually used in the industry, this is a good place to start. And another part of the industry where this is used a lot is, is in the hardware verification. When you're de developing hardware, when Ericsson or ARM or Intel is developing their chips, random test generation is the way to go. There's just no way that they can write the test cases required to get the quality they want. So they have engineers that, whose whole life is to build these big test benches that will that um, uh, make sure that you can s stimulate your design with a flood of information and a flood of streams of, of information and try to figure out if, if, the tool is, uh, if the design is doing what they want. They also go some one step further from time to time, and that is to use uh, formal verification, which is to take these properties and try to mathematically prove them on the design. But that's, I think we're far away from that in the, in the software industry. Any questions on this so far? No? So I'll just give a brief summary. So C Sharp introduces uh, features uh, that are suitable for this type of functional patterns that I've described here namely tuples and pattern matching, allow us to do this in a much more concise way. And it's my hypothesis that new language features like this is not just syntactic surgery, but it's also a way of making uh, or increasing the feasibility of actually building solutions on this type of constructs. It was possible to do this type of pattern matching before with all these if-then-else nested statements, but that's really inconvenient and something you would back away from if you can. But given that we have constructs that allow us to do this in a more succinct way, I think this is going to be used more. And I think it should be used more, because I think it's often is a very nice technique to use. And just like lambda expressions and link was introduced in C Sharp and allows us to do this type of stream-based processing, I think that tuples and pattern matching will allow us to do this type of, um, whoop, type of functional processing of data structures that, I, that I've shown here today. That's pretty much all I have. Uh, just a small list of references. If you want to play around with this demo I just showed you, it's available on GitHub. So you could go there and, uh, and tinker around with it and look at uh, the implementation. Um, and also, this link to this quick check uh, talk that I mentioned is really nice. I can rec recommend that if you have time to look at that. And also, I gave a talk on uh, a similar topic a couple of years ago um, relating to the stream-based processing and the uh, link uh, and lambda expressions, 
So if you're interested to hear my, I hope you found this interesting, and if you're interested to hear more, yeah, this is a talk that uh, focuses more on those features and how those are used in Haskell. All right, any questions? Yes? Didn't mention FS check. FS check. I'm actually not familiar with that. It is? Okay. So there are actually implementations of QuickCheck for a number of different languages, uh, object oriented languages as well, but I have never really seen one that has been taken to, uh, to an industrial strength level. But, but I'll definitely look at that and see what it is. Have you used it? A little bit, okay. Yeah, I'll definitely look into that. Thanks. Anyone else? No? Thank you very much.